Okay, in this series from Telos Ministries, what we're going to do is that we're going to look at what I call the rules of affinity. Now, that might sound a bit grandiose, and uh, all I mean by it is that there are certain, I think, uh, categories that you can put uh, different scriptural propositions or scriptural references to statements of faith and things that we say that we believe and that we try to back up with passages of scripture. Um, affinity just means that there is a connection, a strong connection between one thing and another. So the rules of affinity, what they do is that they, they classify the relationship, whether strong or weak, between the doctrine that we are trying to prove and that we say we believe and the passages of scripture that we use to say that that particular belief is biblical. Now, if you've sp spoken to different people of different theological camps, you will know that all of them will say, well, I believe this because it's biblical. So just saying that you believe something because it's biblical does not in itself prove anything. It doesn't say anything. It might be biblical and it might not be biblical. So what we need to do is we need to get beyond that and we need to find some way to test whether the way we're using scripture and what we're saying the scriptures teach uh, is indeed accurate or whether we need to maybe revise our beliefs or sometimes just revise our proof texts for that belief and go back to uh, get something that's more accurate, something that bears more affinity to the proposition that we're putting forward. So if I can just define what I mean by rules of affinity, and by rules I just mean that loosely, I use them. I hope that you will too, because I think they're helpful. Uh, the rules of affinity measure what I call the distance between the proposition or the statement of belief, let's say in a statement of faith or something like that, and the, the passages that are brought on alongside them to prove them. So, uh, for example, here's the Westminster Confession of Faith. And as many of you know, the Westminster Confession has, uh, this is the shorter catechism at the beginning, question one. And here's the question, and then it has different answers. The answers would be the proposition. And then scriptures are given to back up the truth of the proposition. And normal church statements of faith function along more or less the same lines. So what we do is that we're, we're testing um, the answer here, for example, let me get my glasses on. The question is, what is the chief end of man? And of course, the answer is man's chief end is to glorify God. And then the cross references and to enjoy him forever and more cross-references. So what we're going to do with these rules of affinity is that we're going to test the statement, man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever, to see whether these passages actually do uh, reinforce that statement, or whether the statement actually is uh, an inferred statement and there's no scriptural backing for it at all. I would, by the way, agree that uh, that uh, there is strong affinity between those passages. But that's not always the case. Um, one of the other things that the rules of affinity uh, gauge is that they highlight whether there is a strong link or a weak link between the text and the proposition. Now, if there is a weak link, in other words, if there is not as we will see, any strong correlation between the, um, the affinity of the text and the passage that it's supposed to be supporting, uh, then I think it's time to go back to the drawing board. It's time to find a text that draws closer to the proposition that we want to prove. Or if we can't find any text to prove that proposition, 
well, maybe we need to revise our proposition so that it lines up with the text, because the text of Scripture, by the way, doesn't have to say anything but what it says. Uh, we have to, to align our beliefs with the passages which we adduce for those beliefs. And if we're kind of a way off, then maybe we need to revise our, our uh, views. So what the, the rules of affinity do in that case is that uh, they help us to see whether uh, we need to, to go in search of better texts which more clearly say what we need it to say. Now let me give you a little example uh, here. All of us know Shakespeare's uh, sonnet, I think it's uh, sonnet number eight, which starts off, shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Obviously that's poetic, um, but there are certain affinities that we can draw between the description that Shakespeare has of the, of the man, the young man, in that line, and uh, with something that we may say about it. If we ask somebody, okay, so shall I compare thee to a summer's day? What do you think Shakespeare is trying to evoke there. You would be very surprised if you got back from people that, uh, oh, um, he's trying to say that, that, that the young person was diseased or that they were sad or that they were distraught or something like that. That's, that's not the, uh, the feeling that those words evoke. They're obviously, it's obviously a figure of speech, and yet the plain sense or literal or face value meaning of that does not translate as, oh, you're looking pretty sickly today. Rather, it means that, you know, you're bright, you're vibrant, you're lively, um, your face is shining, you have a lot of life in you, something like that. You see, the affinity between the statement, even if it's a poetic statement, and what we say about it has got to be as close as possible. And that's what we want to do also with passages of Scripture. Um, we want to make sure that our theological beliefs are really biblical in the sense that when we go to the Bible, we can actually see that that's what the Bible says. And then we have a clear understanding of these things. And so uh, let me run through what these rules of affinity are. I, I classify them as categories. So I put the, uh, the letter C, capital C, there for category, and then I just classify them as one to five. And in that classification, one would be a very strong affinity between the text of Scripture and between the texts that I used. So for example here, uh, we believe that justification is by grace through faith. Um, so where might we go for that proof? Well, we could go for to uh, Romans chapter 5, couldn't we? So we could turn to Romans 5 and verse 1, where we're told here very clearly, let me just get to it, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we also have access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And again, if we, we see the same thing in Galatians 2, 16, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Christ Jesus that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law no flesh shall be justified. And, you know, we have numerous passages which say something the same. Verse 24 of chapter 3, Therefore the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. So when somebody says, I believe that we are justified by faith. Well, he, all he needs to do is to go to these kinds of passages which say that we're justified by faith. The 
uh, the affinity between what we say we believe and the proof text that we use is very close. In fact, it's, it's direct. Uh, let's think of another one. We believe that uh, uh, God created the heavens and the earth. So everything is, is God created. Well, where do we go? John, uh, Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So can you see there is a direct correspondence between the passage of scripture that we're using and the statement of uh, belief that we have? Uh, again, when we say that Christ rose bodily from the dead or when we say that uh, we are uh, sinners and uh, when we say that Christ is coming back again. Any, in fact, any of these major doctrines of Scripture, you will find that we have what I call a direct correspondence between text and, um, and the proposition or the, or the belief that we say we hold to. And there are very few exceptions to that. Um, the Trinity would be an exception because there are no direct statements saying God is a Trinity or God is three in one. God is three persons and one essence or anything like that. Not even, by the way, uh, 1 John 5, uh, 7 does that if you have that in your, script, in your Bibles. I believe it should be there. But uh, that doesn't say, uh, it's not a Trinitarian verse, really. It's not a Trinitarian proof text. Um, there are no Trinitarian proof texts. However, what we do find in Scripture over and over and over again, we find it in Romans 8, we find it in uh, John 16, we find it in John 1, it, it's all over the place, actually, uh, is... A, Trinitarian passages, we find that God the Father is God. Jesus is God. Just think of, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Um, John 20, 28, my Lord and my God, Thomas confesses to Jesus. Jesus doesn't rebuke him or correct him, because what he said is a true statement. The Holy Spirit is God. In Acts chapter 5, you have not lied to man, but you've lied to God, Peter says to, um, to Ananias. So um, the, the Bible teaches that the Father is God, the Son is God, and the Spirit is God. And yet, we know that God is one. We know the Shema in, in Deuteronomy 6.4, our Lord, our, the Lord our God is one Lord. And uh, we know, of course, the, the first commandment. We know that there is just one God. He alone is God. And yet, it, inevitably, we have to say, although there is one God, the Father is God, the Son is God, the Spirit is God. They have interrelationships with each other. Therefore, it must be a true statement to say there is one God, yet three within the Godhead. And that really is an inevitable conclusion coming from the scriptural passages. Now, what that is, is not a C1 doctrine. It's not a category one doctrine because there's no direct affinity, as I said, saying that uh, the Trinity is, is a Bible doctrine. But this must be a C2 because it's an inevitable conclusion based on what the Bible testifies about God. And therefore, uh, you have C1s, direct statements, such as justified by faith or creation or something like that. Or occasionally you have these C2s, uh, the Trinitarian doctrine being an example of that. Let me be a little bit more clear on this. Here's a, a C1, and we'll, we'll stick this up so that you can, you can see it and maybe write this down. A C1 uh, rule of affinity is uh, that there is a doctrinal proposition or statement of belief based on a straightforward quotation of Scripture. For example, Genesis 1.1, 1, 1, uh, John 3.16, uh, Romans 5, 1, any of these kinds of, of texts, John 20, 28, 
um, Revelation um, 19, 11 and following about the second coming. Um, something that the talks say about special creation, justification by faith, the deity of Christ, the virgin birth, the inspiration of scripture, 2 Timothy 3, 16, the pervasiveness of sin among the human race. So, well, Romans, the first three chapters, we'll kind of do that for you. Just pick any verse from that. Uh, 3.26 might be a good idea, or 3.23. Uh, there's salvation only through Jesus, the bodily resurrection, the physical return of Christ, heaven, hell, New Jerusalem, something like that. All of these, you can go straight to the Bible and they say that these things are what they are. And all you have to do is you formulate a sentence, a proposition that says, we believe in the fact that God created the heavens and the earth. And there you are, you've kind of built in your, the scripture into your, uh, your statement. That's a C1 correspondence, a direct correspondence. Now, something interesting here is that nearly all of the fundamental doctrines of scripture, nearly all of the main doctrines that we as Christians believe, we might differ on a number of things, but the fundamental things we don't disagree on, and they're nearly all C1s, they're nearly all direct quotations from the scriptures themselves. A C2, and I've given you an example of the Trinity, is a propositional statement based on a strong inference. In other words, it's an inevitable conclusion that we infer based on the witness of several passages which kind of come together uh, bringing about one doctrine. And as I've said, God is one, God is undivided, yet the Father is God, the Son is God, the Spirit is God. Therefore, the, uh, the inevitable conclusion is that God is one and yet God is three. So that's a C2. Uh, certain others, I think that the inerrancy of Scripture is a C2. Uh, there isn't a, a doctrinal, there isn't a passage of Scripture which says, all scripture is inerrant. Uh, there are passages which speak about the fact that God cannot lie, that God speaks truth, that this is the word of God, and we infer from that the inerrancy of scripture. That's a very strong, in fact, it's an inevitable conclusion from who God is and what the Bible is. So that's a C2. Um, men only eldership, I would put in there too. So C1 and C2 formulations in the rules of affinity, while they may be nuanced and improved, are non-negotiable. These are the things that all Orthodox Christians believe. And all Orthodox statements of faith have these doctrines in them. The weight of direct and or strong scriptural inference in their favor requires that they be held as the most basic fundamental Bible doctrines among all Christians. So just to, re to review here, what I'm saying is that the rules of affinity identify that direct statements or inevitable statements um, on fundamental Bible doctrines are always very close in their affinity. It's not, uh, you're never going to get you making a statement about, say, the resurrection of Jesus Christ and, you know, fumbling around the Bible trying to find that and then putting together some kind of um, clever argument to, to prove that that's actually what the Bible teaches. You won't need to do that. All you need to do is point at the scriptures which uh, tell us that Christ rose physically from the dead. And, uh, you know, Bob's your uncle, away you go. So all of the fundamental doctrines of the Christian faith are either C1s, nearly all of them are, or C2s. Now that in itself, I think, is very helpful because the Bible has not been written uh, as an elusive book where we have to kind of uh, scout around trying to, to 
cull together these different beliefs and then try to find proof texts for them. No, uh, these statements of belief come straight out of the Bible. In our next uh, video, what I want to do is to continue looking at uh, C3s and following and look out.